Hi there, everyone. Jeanette Linfoot here. Welcome to the Brave Bold Brilliant podcast. Now, the episode you're going to hear now was actually recorded back in May 2020. And it was when I was lucky enough to be invited onto Laura Muse's podcast, The Social Propertypreneur. And we had such a great conversation that I really wanted to share it with you here today. Now, a lot has changed in the world since then. And certainly one of the things is that Chris and I have actually relocated for our property business from London up to Manchester. So that's one change. But a lot of what we talk about is still absolutely relevant to today and to the journey that we're on as two women in business. Uh, So I hope you're going to enjoy it. I certainly really loved having the conversation with Laura. So over to you guys and I will see you on the other side. Thanks. And remember, be brave, be bold, be bold. Well, welcome to the podcast episode. Um, Today, obviously, we're doing a live stream as well. So a lot of you know this wonderful lady for the people who do it and who are listening to the podcast. Um, I'd like to welcome, obviously, this is a social propertypreneur podcast with me, Laura Muse. And we've got a very special guest today who is a multiple business owner and property investor. Um, she's one businesswoman of the year, and she's also um, one of the most influential women in the travel industry. And she's an absolute power player and a true inspiration to many women. And I'd love to introduce the amazing Jeanette Linfoot. Yeah. <laughs> Thanks, <Laura. laughs> You all right, Jeanette? I'm fantastic, yeah. How are you? Yeah, good, thank you. Um, well, thank you so much for your time today. I, I really do appreciate it. And I think a lot of people are 100% going to get so much value from this. And um, whether you're watching now or you're going to listen to the podcast, because you've done some incredible things. That's very kind of you to say. <laughs> so I'm just going to run through a couple of questions, if that's okay. Obviously, it's probably all going to a conversation. But um, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. So just for people who don't know who you are, do you mind just telling us a little bit about you, your journey and kind of how you've got to where you are now? Yeah, sure. So you can probably tell from my dulcet tones that I'm a northerner, I'm a manker. Yay! Yeah, another fellow northerner. Um, yeah, so, so you know, I'm, I spent most of my career in the travel industry, so 25 years, but I, um, I started life originally, actually, as a government economist in Whitehall. Wow. Which all sounds very grand, but you know, I was there a couple of years and quickly realised that the uh, the grey suits and cardigans of the civil service were not for me. So uh, jumped into travel pretty quickly after that, and uh, and that's where I spent most of my career. Uh, and yeah, you know, worked for some some big brands that you'll all be aware of. You know, Thompson, Thomas Cook, First Choice, Tui. I've pretty much done the rounds over the years, and. Uh, yeah, started off at the Boston, really, like most people do, graduate scheme, all that kind of stuff. And then really worked my way up and um, through those organisations um, until I became the managing director of the emerging markets for TUI. So I oh. bought, ran, sold businesses in crazy parts of the world, Russia, China, India, Brazil, you name it. Uh, and then in my last kind of big corporate role, I was the CEO of the travel division for Saga. So there I had a portfolio of four businesses. Um, So yeah, it's been an interesting career. Um, But a couple of years ago, I decided to sort of jump out of the corporate world, if you like, and to pursue more of a portfolio. Um, So yeah, which is kind of where I am now, really, and enjoying the variety and what have you. So yeah, it's been an interesting time, that's for sure. So... Could you tell me a little bit more, because obviously you've got a couple of businesses, could you just um, tell us a little bit about, because they are quite different, aren't they, what you do? Yeah, yeah, but, I mean, essentially I've got three main businesses, so one of them is all around, it's almost an extension of my corporate life, if you like, where I work with a lot of boards advising them, mainly on things like strategy, or mergers and acquisitions. So if they want to buy a business, um, I will work with them on that business and kind of assess, you know, the viability. Is it a good business, a bad business? How much should we pay? What they're going to do once they've acquired the business? So that's sort of one part of what I do. Sort of the the work, and I work with a lot of private equity clients um, who are interested in the acquisition space. So that's one business. The second business is my property business, uh, which is with my lovely, beloved Chris Buzzertill. Um, 
So ingeniously, our property business, we thought, oh my gosh, how, what name should we have? So it's Buzz Foot, which is the bus from Chris's buzzer tool, and the foot from me. So that's <laughs> Our property, property business, Buzzfoot there, uh, Buzzfoot Property. And then the third um, business I have is a business mentoring um, business where I work with a whole range of, of individuals, really, men and women uh, from all different sectors, whether they're at a more junior stage of their career or, or indeed sort of at board level or trying to kind of get into the boardroom. So, so that's what I do. And then I do a kind of bunch of pro bono stuff as well. Um, so I do some... Uh, mentoring, which I do for free with Odgers and Bernston, uh, which is one of the big exec search companies. I'm a judge on Every Woman in Travel, and I'm just about to join the advisory board for an organization called the Founders Factory, which works with young entrepreneurial startups mainly. Oh, so, yeah, a bunch of stuff going on, really. Yeah. Amazing. <laughs> so, you um, obviously, we've spoken a lot um, previously about how you inspire women, how you get them thought into a boardroom position. What led you to start doing that? What, obviously, was it your previous background in property that kind of, you didn't see many women in that position and you felt, you know, you've obviously got a real passion and you inspire people to do that. Do you mind just giving a bit more about that element? Yeah, yeah, I mean, and listen, I mean, it's kind of evolved over, over the years, you know, I've been mentoring for, I would say, more than 15 years um, in, bed, in one capacity or another. And, you know, I guess from, from my perspective, I kind of come from a very working class family, the only one to go to university, you know, and, and really lucky to have the amazingly supportive parents and, and sisters that I had. Nonetheless, I progressed from you know as I say from very working class roots so I guess for me I, I'm really interested in how anyone can achieve their potential in life um, whether that's men, man or woman I guess from a more female perspective you know I've nearly always been the only woman in the boardroom in very male dominated environment so that kind of pisses me off a little bit <laughs> do anything to, to kind of help anyone male or female or, or any you know from whichever cultural backgrounds whether you know working class or different parts of the world I just get a huge amount of personal satisfaction from that and so it's partly been because of my own journey um, I guess that I feel I've, I can probably help people with sharing some of that and, and how that can help um, and I you know I've always had great mentors and people that have helped me and influenced me and, and sometimes that's formal or informal right you know sometimes you just gel with someone and then they naturally become a bit of a mentor so I've been really lucky uh, so I think to, to give something back and to help other people in that way is, is something I feel really passionate about so now you know if you talk about gender diversity just for yeah. a second not that I'm getting on my soapbox but Go for it. <laughs> yeah <laughs> so so you know if you look at um, boys and girls coming out of education it's pretty much 50-50 out of either college or university. But why is it then that when we get to the most senior positions in industry or business, that if you talk about sort of listed companies as an example, 70% of those board positions are taken by men. And, and in the UK, you know, a woman doing the same job as a man earns 77% less. It earns only 77% of oh, the same of the salary so, so that just feels inherently wrong to me you know so I just think if, if I can help anyone as I say male or female to, to kind of help them progress their career or set up a business or climb the ladder or whatever they want to achieve in their personal life then that, that's just got to be a good thing I think so I, I'm, I'm come from a very normal position you know what you see is what you get with me um, so yeah, that, that's kind of where it all started, Laura, to be honest. So probably not the shortest answer in the world. But um, yeah, I think it's, it's a nice area to be in and uh, something that I really enjoy doing. Why do, you think, why do you think there is such a big, big difference with, especially like your industry, a big percentage of, of men that are in the boardroom compared to women? Why, why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one, because if you take travel and tourism, which is where I spent a chunk of my, my time, you know, actually 75% of the industry is, is female, you know, so if you think about travel agents and reps and, and, you know, all that kind of stuff. 
Um, but actually at the board level, um, in terms of female CEOs, it's 6%. Oh. So it really drops off a cliff. Now, now some of that is because of the practicalities. If you're in a travel business, you have to travel um, generally. You know, it's kind of an occupational hazard. So, you know, if you think about working mums, you know, that's not always that easy uh, to do that. Um, so some of it is structural in the sector. Um, but equally, some of it is, is just having role models, I think, as well. Mm -hmm. You know, you almost need to get a critical mass of, of women or, or, you know, whether you're black, gay, you know, whatever diversity we're talking about, um, you know, sort of someone with disability needs, etc. You, when you start to get um, people like that at senior levels, then it, it really sets um, a tone that you can do it too. Um, so I think there's been a lack of role models historically, and that's changing. You know, we are getting a lot better um, and I guess, I guess also sometimes it's as women, I think we, we hold ourselves back a little bit as well, you know, and, um, you know, as men and women, we are different and that's what makes it so great. It's not one is better or worse than the other. It's that we, we just have different gifts that we bring to the table. Yeah. Um, so, you know, for me, it's not, it's not about bashing men and saying, oh, come on, up, up the women. It's, it's around balance and, and having more of a level playing field, really. So there's a whole bunch of stuff. Um, but I think sometimes as women, we, we don't always push ourselves forward as much. You know, if you, if you, it's proven that if you look at a job description, for example, you know, that the guy would sort of look at it and go, oh yeah, I can do 70% of that, brilliant, I'm gonna go for it. Whereas the woman more typically, would look at the 30% that maybe she's not got direct experience of and, and hone in on that. And yeah. um, so there's some of those sort of inherent traits, you know, we need to work on that. And that's also where the mentoring comes in because actually we all know, I mean, look at what the amazing business you've created with James, you know, you know, that if you set your mind to something and you feel passionate about it and you accept that not everything is going to be perfect and there's going to be a few, you know, <laughs> turns on the journey. But actually, <laughs> Yeah, put yourself out there and really go for it. You know, we know that, it's proven. And the other thing is that actually, the fact, you know, never mind it being the right thing to do, but it's financially proven that businesses that have a, a balanced board or a balanced leadership team deliver superior financial results. So actually, from a commercial point of view, it's, it's the right thing as well. So, yeah. <laughs> it's an interesting <laughs> You know, obviously in your, your business mentoring that you do do, obviously you meet a lot of people that have just started out with an idea potentially to get to that next level. Or they've got a business that's been running for a few years, but they want to grow and scale it to that next. In regards to like mindset, what types of things, because obviously I think majority of that is a mindset shift. Um, mm -hmm. What things do you help them implement into their business to make them exceed and and go on to the next the next level really yeah i mean you know everyone's different everyone's yeah. coming from a slightly different background or a different starting point or you know so so i guess there isn't a one solution fits all it is yeah. very much individualized perspective and that's the approach i will always take is you know trying to really understand that person and where they're trying to head to a bit about their background and, and what maybe some of the challenges that they're facing and then really trying to create something that's very bespoke and tailor-made for that individual. But there are some common themes, I yeah. would say. The main one is, is self-belief, to be honest, you know, and I think we all, all of us have different little gremlins. Um, and as I say, this isn't just a female thing, this is a male thing as well, it, it, it's across the board. And, um, you know, and sometimes we'll, we'll have, you know, the old imposter syndrome will kick in, and it also, you know, you're not good enough, or you don't deserve to be at the table, or, oh, you've got a northern accent, and everyone speaks really posh. Or, In there with that one. <laughs> <laughs> no, seriously, it could, be, it could be a whole host of things. I remember when I, just flipping back, when I joined the Government Economic Service, right, and it was in Whitehall, 90% of people had been to Oxford or Cambridge. Now I've gone to Leeds, right? And Leeds is really <laughs> my hometown. <laughs> and I came out with a first class honours degree in economics, equally as capable as all of those Oxbridge graduates. And they didn't have a problem with it, but probably in my mind, I made it 
something, you know, and it actually wasn't. So sometimes you just have to try and really work on those little gremlins and that self-belief that sometimes you'll have a voice that's just stopping you from, from doing something. Um, so, so that's a common theme, I would say, in, in that sort of the whole mindset space. And I think also, you know, sometimes people struggle to almost get it clear in their own heads what their purpose is. You know, what are they really wanting to do? And that can change over time. You know, sometimes you might be focused more on family or you might be focused more on the business or your career, you know. But I think helping draw that out of people is quite useful because, you know, if you know where you're heading, then you kind of can work backwards from there and break it down into manageable chunks. Because sometimes, you know, you might say, oh, I want to be a multimillionaire that's absolutely brilliant you know have a really really big goal fantastic and then you start to really break it down because that can seem well god where do i start you know what's the, what's the saying um how do you eat an elephant you know one bite at a time and, and <laughs> i think sometimes like being clear on your purpose having the right sort of mindset and self-belief and then backing it up with a very practical action plan um goes a long way um, and then things like networking as well, you know, sometimes people are absolutely terrified of networking, um, you know, and, and, and again, you know, some people are very comfortable in front of others, some people are more shy or feel more nervous, but, you know, the more influential, not influential in a, in, in a way that, you know, if you spend time with people that have a positive mindset that you're going to learn from, that are going to inspire you, you know, again, that's just going to give you a great boost of energy. And who knows where those conversations are going to lead to as well. So, you know, those are just some of the areas really that I tend to try and work with people. But there's never one size fits all. Yeah. Never. But overall, they're kind of mindset. Um, well, common commonalities between people that like you probably see. Absolutely. And sometimes you know, you're feeling great, aren't you? You're feeling top of the world and you're oh. all raring to go jump out of bed with a spring in your step and it's all fantastic. <laughs> And, and then other days, you're just kind of not feeling it, you know? And I think some, sometimes we're very hard on ourselves. You know, we can beat ourselves up a little bit. And it's actually okay to have an off day and just realize that we're all human and none of us are perfect. We're all work in progress. And, you know, cut yourself a bit of slack. Be kind to yourself um, and enjoy the ride along the way. I think sometimes we're so ambitious. We're so on to the next thing. What's the next thing? What's the next thing that we don't stop? And just kind That's of one thing we struggle with, definitely, especially my husband. We, as soon as we've done something, we just move on to the next thing. We don't actually like pause and enjoy what we've what we've accomplished or what we've just finished. Um, we just like straight into the next thing. Like, I don't feel like I'm getting anywhere. It's because we don't actually stop and think. Actually, we've done quite quite a bit these last few months. Are but that's what we're we're trying to rectify. You know, <laughs> and sometimes it's not. The big things is it you know I mean obviously you can achieve a massive goal and then you know you want to crack the champagne open but sometimes it's just like oh actually yeah, I got through that that small piece of work and I've been putting it off and I've done it now I'm going to reward myself you know with a, a cup of tea and a ginger nut <laughs> <laughs> celebrate the little things along the way as well <laughs> well that brings us on to property obviously we met through property property is kind of um is well all about my life um Tell me how you've kind of, what was, because obviously you've been in property for quite a while, it's not just something new to you, but mm. what kind of made you decide to scale it up? Because um, obviously you've got some great mentors um, that you, you've got now that help you pushing you to the next level. Do you mind telling yeah. us a little bit about that and the strategy you use and kind of where you see you be, you know, where you want the property business to go? Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So, I mean, we dabbled, I would say like is common with a lot of people isn't it and it was yeah it's great it's great the network that we're all part of you know to to meet people like you Laura and James and all the other great people that we we've had access to has been so amazing and refreshing especially when you spent career in, in in what mainly one sector to be in property in a proper way is is brilliant so so we're really grateful for that but I think it kind of coincided with me coming out of the corporate world, um, and Chris as well had spent most of his career in the travel industry, he'd actually retired, and he'll tell you a story very well <laughs> about how he's enjoying his life, and this, that, and the other, and then I dragged him out of retirement. I think he's expecting him to like pop up behind you. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, he's not, he's not, he's 
uh, I think it's downstairs, but um, anyway, so um, yeah, so, so I, guess, I guess part, some of it was timing um, in that we, you know, I decided I wanted a more of a plural career. I'd also, you know, I guess we were thinking about long term, you know, mid to long term, what do we want out of our life? And, you know, quite frankly, even if you're in a very senior role in any organisation, I mean, you know, you're still exchanging your time for money, yeah. whereas with property, it, you know as, as, as you know very well if you do it in the right way actually you can create a really decent asset base for yourself um, that you know you can leverage nicely and that and it can produce passive income obviously you have to work hard at the beginning to get things in place as we know it's not just as easy as that um, but once you've got down that road it, you know it can really make quite a difference in terms of your you know your income and you know actually having a good solid asset portfolio that's there for the future as well so so i guess we like the idea of all of that um yeah so we really you know thought you know where first of all we we got ourselves educated um mm -hmm. as i think a pretty common theme we're being mentored by Rob Moore and Mark Homer, as you know, which is great, who are the founders of Progressive, and they have been amazing for us, really. Um, and we knew that if we were going to do this, we, we didn't want to, you know, just do something that was going to be small, you know, so our, our aspirations are really big. But of course, you've got to get going and you, you need to start in the right way. So. And also, we live in London, uh, despite my Mancunian my accent. Uh, but we, you know, the strategy that we, we're following, which I'll go into in a bit more detail, just, just doesn't work that well down here because just the purchase prices are so high. Mm -hmm. So we thought, well, if we're not going to invest in our local area, what's the next best thing? And it was either going to be Swansea, where Chris is from, or Manchester, where I'm from. So we chose Manchester. Uh, and that's really where we've focused for a number of reasons. And, and you know, Laura, we're doing we're doing simple residential buy to lets um, using you know the buy refurbish refinance model, which we've all uh, we're all quite in tune with. But for for maybe people watching, they might not know too much about that. But essentially, you know, you buy a property that where you can add value. So buy it at a good price, add value through a refurbishment. Um, and then refinance it, obviously at a higher value because you've added value, take as much of your original investment back out of that property. So you still own the property at the end, you've got it rented out, so you've got passive income coming in from your tenants, and then you use that investment to recycle your cash and just keep buying. And that's basically the model that we're following. And you know what's what's really nice is that I guess because we're we're learning things, we've learned in the right way, you yeah. know, you're then in a to to almost copy and paste and then you gain confidence through that so you know our intention is to continue with the building the buy to let portfolio um for our you, you know and also we're getting a, a lot of a, a lot of interest from investors uh, which is great because if we can you know provide superior returns for our investors as well then that is great you know a lot of people want to get into property don't have the time they're sort of cash rich time poor um or just want a better return than they're going to get in the bank which clearly right now is you know interest rate is 0.1 percent <laughs> so when you apply inflation backwards in value in 12 months time so you know so that's really great so we're focusing on the buy select side of things but once we get out of this lockdown period that we're in, um, that we'll be expanding into HMOs as well, uh, because the cash flow is is higher, as we know. But it's you know it's it's the next evolution for us. And then who knows? You know, longer term, I'd quite like to do commercial conversions and all all sorts. So, yeah, that's kind of where we are, really. Cool. So, what is your what are your goals? Do you mind sharing them with us? What goals are in terms of property? Yeah, because I, mean, I know that it's a pretty high figure. <laughs> <laughs> well, I would like us to be having a portfolio that's worth, you know, 15 million plus um, in property in terms of the, the value of the properties yeah. um, and how we get there. You know, obviously the properties that we buy, um, you, well, if you're in central London, you might struggle to buy one property for 15 million. <laughs> a <in> garage. Thanks <laughs> <laughs> like parking space. Uh, but obviously in Manchester, the, the entry point is much lower. So, you know, we, the volume of properties will, will, will evolve depending on, you know, the mix between buy-to-lets and, and HMOs. Um, but really on the buy-to-let side, we're focusing on two, three-bed houses, um, mainly around um, sort of 
West Manchester, so around Eccles, Salford, okay. which is you know easily commutable into into the okay. into the centre of Manchester, uh, but you can still purchase at, you know reasonable prices and great rental market as well. And there's just been so much investment in Manchester, not dissimilar to Sheffield, Laura, that you're seeing as well. So we're actually, a little bit behind Manchester. <laughs> well, we're getting there. <laughs> There's some common themes though, aren't there, about these, you know, these, these sort of um, previous industrial northern towns, you know. Um, so Sheffield was all, was all about the steel and, and Manchester was all about the cotton mills, essentially, you know. So the, they're evolving and moving forward. Um, and I think that's great for the city. And it means that the demand is high for rental. You know, you've got a lot of corporates relocating as well. You know, the BBC is up in Media City now. So it made a lot of sense. And, and importantly for me, you know, my family's there. So it's yeah. great because I get to see more of my mum, my lovely sisters, my nieces and nephews, drive them all crazy. Um, and yes, we just kind of works. Really. So we're excited about it. So how often do you go back to Manchester? Well, not um, right now. You don't go, well, but, you know, when we're not in lockdown. <laughs> yeah. I would say we're probably spending 50-50 our time um, between Manchester and London. So it just depends, you know, I mean, you know what it's like. It, it, sometimes you just, you know, you, you pack your diary full of viewings or whatever. You've got renovation projects going on and you need to be a bit more on the ground. Other times it's more dealing with the investors and the finance side, which is more probably more of a London centric um, approach. So more or less 50-50, I would say. Um, yeah, so my mum's delighted. She's never seen so much of me. You know, I, 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 I came to London in like 94. Oh, so really? I've been to, yeah, I said I would stay three years and here I am 25 years later. You know, <laughs> and so my mum's never seen more of me. So yeah, so it's nice. It's really nice. So obviously <laughs> with you living in London and having properties in Manchester, how do you manage that when you've got projects? Are you completely using, obviously, leveraging other people's experiences or are you still a little bit quite hands-on because I know Chris is quite is quite his background is quite, quite well connected should I say so does he get involved in that or do you outsource yeah. it? how does it work so on the I mean on the building side of things we've got a great building partner that does deals with the refurbishments for us so you know obviously we'll spend time in terms of scoping out the you know what we want to do with the property and agreeing you know the spec and all that kind of stuff uh, but pretty much once we've done that our building partner will then he'll he'll manage it from there um, so we leverage that I mean quite frankly you know neither Chris or I are very good at changing a plug never mind anything else so that's certainly <laughs> not our forte, not our forte. Um, so yeah having having people that you that you trust is key isn't it I mean in any business but especially if you're working remotely um, and then, you know, on the estate agent side, most of our properties we source through agents. Um, and Chris is really concentrating in particular on, you know, building those relationships. He's fantastic at that. Um, and obviously I'll, I'll do the donut round and the coffee round and stuff and take the champagne and when we, when we complete and things like that. But building those relationships has been absolutely key. And I think the thing that people don't often talk about when you're setting up your property business is all the stuff you need to do at the beginning before you even get to buying anything. Um, and that takes time and effort, doesn't it? You know, and, and those hours you spend are, are well invested, I think. Um, so yeah, a combination of, well, I'll focus more on the finance and the investor side. Chris will focus more on the lead generation and, and securing the deals. And then we'll very much use our building partner and then the lessons agent or manage the tenants. So we've got a bit of a combination, Laura, to be honest. So what, in regards to obviously your other businesses, you must yeah. have some really great transferable skills. I don't think a lot of people identify that they've got transferable skills, especially when they're starting property. There's a lot of people I speak that say, oh, well, I've got no property experience. I don't know where to start. What would you say to people who are just starting out thinking that how would they identify what they can transfer over from their current roles or previous roles how would you advise someone to go about doing that yeah i mean i think i think you're, it's, it's a really really great point though because everyone has transferable skills right everyone it doesn't matter what field you've been you might have been in operations you might have been in finance you might have you know been more on the um, marketing side or of whatever you've done in your previous career. So everyone has transferable skills. But again, sometimes it's that mindset, 
piece that, that can unnerve us and make us think, oh gosh, it's a new industry. I don't know anything. Um, and and you, you do have to sort of, I think, take a deep breath, calmly just reflect on all of the great things you've done in your career or in your previous businesses or whatever it might be. Or, you know, you might have worked for charity. You know, again, there's so, you know, people have such a wide variety of backgrounds, but there will absolutely be uh, transferable skills for everyone. So, you know, I think sometimes you just have to kind of put the gremlins to one side, just step back a little bit, realise how bloody great you are, and um, write that down <laughs> you need to <laughs> remind yourself, I am amazing. <laughs> um, and, and then I think, um, you know, if you're doing it with your partner, you know, obviously, you know, Chris and I are in the business together, you and James are in the business together, or you might have, you know, another partner or a few people in the business. I think it's then really important to, to say, okay, well, well, who's going to focus on what? Yeah. Because I think certainly, especially if you're, a, if you're a, a husband and wife team, sometimes you can find that you might butt up against each other a little bit. I, I Definitely in the early days. Because <laughs> <laughs> you're finding your, your, your new flow, aren't you? you know? so, and, and certainly Chris and I have, have really sort of divided our talents, um, if you like, and our experiences. So there's always transferable skills. Take some time to just step back and think about what they may be. And then, you know, there will be gaps, of course, there'll be knowledge gaps in terms of understanding the sector. So get yourself educated and, you know, that, that you kind of pay for that if you really want to, to do it in a more detailed way. Or there's loads of free stuff online. Or, you know, get to know people. You know, generally, I think in the world of property, people are very, very helpful. Um, and, and because there's enough to go around for everyone. You know, in, in the world that I've lived in, sometimes it's ruthless. You know, people. I was just going to say, I found it so strange when I first came into property because people genuinely wanted to help, and my first thought was, "What do they want?" <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely. You know, people will sell their grandmother to <laughs> climb the slippery pole of the of, of their career. You know, sometimes, but properties. I mean, of course, you're going to meet the old person that's maybe not quite your cup of tea, right? Fine. But generally, I think the people are happy to help and share their experience and knowledge. So, you know, the great thing is property, anyone can do it, actually. Um, you know, so it's just trying to really focus on what's going to be right for you. And I think go at your own pace as well, you know, because everyone's different. Again, your objectives are different. You're coming from a different starting point. You know, for what some people, it might just be a case of having one or two buy to lets. It's a little bit of a nest egg, and, and that's great. You know, they're happy with that. For other people, they want to build large businesses like, like, like we're doing, you know. And, but there's no one size fits all. So I, I would definitely try and not compare yourself too much to other people. Um, and if that puts you in a negative mindset of feeling pressure and unnecessary pressure. So last but not least, while we finish this podcast, would you mind obviously with what's going on, we've got a global pandemic that's going on with COVID-19. How has, has it or has it even affected your property business and what do you think kind of maybe the repercussions potentially may be in property? Yeah, I mean, obviously it's, it's you know, the word unprecedented. I don't think I've ever heard it so much ever. <laughs> Um, but it's true, isn't it? You know, it is unprecedented and, and everyone's trying to sort of navigate through this in the best way they can. So, you know, I mean, in terms of the pipeline, shall we say, of, of deals and properties being sold, etc., that's difficult right now, clearly, because, you know, you, you're not able to do viewings, you know, valuers are not, are not going out. You know, so, so actually on that side of things, there's clearly a bit of a press pause, I would say, to a certain degree. It doesn't mean to say it's impossible, but, but probably not as easy as it was before. Um, but actually, when we come out, for, us, for us, it's all about putting ourselves in a, in a good position to come out of this. You know? So I think businesses and individuals that have conserved cash, um, either their own cash or investor cash, you know, and sort of, you know, keep in touch with your investors because they will still want to invest in property. Um, certainly that's what we're, what we're finding. Um, so be careful with your cash. And then I think coming out the other side, of course, there's going to be an impact. How long, how deep, who knows? You know, we don't have a crystal ball, but I wouldn't be surprised if property prices fell. Um, I think that's probably an obvious thing. By how much, who knows? Um, could be significant, you know, could be 20, 30%. Yeah. Um, 
I do think there's more liquidity in the fight in the banks probably than the last crash. You know, if you think about 2008, it was you know, it was all about the subprime mortgages in the U.S. that then kind of rippled. Mm -hmm. um, don't think that's the same challenge now. So, so I think coming out the other side, finance should be available. Um, I think there'll be more properties coming on the market if you're in the residential space. Yeah. Uh, because unfortunately, whether we like it or not, you know, there are going to be certain individuals that are going to have quite financial hardships through this. Mm -hmm. There are maybe homeowners now that may need to sell their properties and therefore will then s switch into the rental market. So I think there'll be more properties. I think there'll probably be fewer investors um, because you know people's circumstances might mean they haven't got quite as much cash. But you know what, at the end of the day, people need good solid housing to live in. 100%. So, you know, so I think the lettings market will actually be stronger. So, so for us, we're, whilst it's difficult right now, of course, and we're very focused on the human aspect of COVID-19, because at the end of the day, thousands of people are losing their lives and they're, you know, facing financial hardship. That's awful. From a business point of view, there will be opportunities out the other side. Um, I think the high street might look different going forward. I mean, obviously, retail was having a difficult time before all of this. You know, so will there be more opportunities with commercial conversions? Maybe. Um, yeah, so I think it'll be interesting. I mean, obviously, we're all going to be watching closely, aren't we? And I think the key is to, to, to make um, rational, calm decisions and not to knee-jerk react too much one way or another, let things settle a little bit. But, but then, you know, once you've got those opportunities, just go for it. I think if you've got ambitions to build a big business or invest in property, um, it's going to be a good time, actually. Oh, well, thank you so much, Jeanette. Um, I really enjoyed speaking to you. I always do. I hope everyone who's watching live and who's going to be listening to this podcast has. If you have, I've put in the show notes. Um, there's going to be all Jeanette's details. Um, you can follow her on social media, go onto her website and connect with Jeanette. Um, thank you very much who's watching and um, we can't see because there's a few streams going on um, <laughs> we will go back and look at any questions if you popped any questions in and answer them um, but thank you again to next oh thank you Laura I really love speaking to you thank you so much <laughs>